Hi, my name is Azubi K. Ononye. Uh, you can call me Zubi. And um, I'm chair of uh, Computational Design Detroit. Um, as you can imagine, our uh, the way the way we work, the way we uh, deliver services and consume services has completely changed. Um, and we as an industry, AEC, are not immune um, to that change. It's definitely going to hit us hard. It started already, and that's why we exist as um, an organization, uh, Computational Design Detroit. Uh, we are here because we want to empower students and professionals in the AEC industry to learn computational thinking, share computational thinking, and also implement computational thinking. Um, computational thinking is at the heart. It's beyond grasshopper, it's beyond dynamo. It's more of the philosophy, the approach behind how we leverage technology and how we work and deliver our services. And um, the only way as a group that we can do this is because of the amazing people that make up this team. Um, so if you see them uh, on the Discord channel, uh, please make sure you uh, say hi to them. So in terms of uh, Discord, this is where we kind of have our community and you can follow that link or go to that link to uh, join it and be part of uh, the conversations that go on, on there. So this is just an, to give you an idea, people have questions on it. Um, somebody somewhere is going to answer you if you have any questions. Um, also, you can find us on uh, Instagram. Uh, you can find us on uh, YouTube. Uh, we are uh, Cody. Um, a huge resource for you as well is our YouTube channel, where we have uh, events like this, which will be uh, recorded. And if you feel like you need to check it out again, which you should, um, feel free to go to our YouTube channel. And we also have uh, a webinar series uh, for people who are learning uh, Grasshopper up to intermediate level. We have a, a five part series for, for you on there. So subscribe and uh, you'll get more content from us. And I mean, we would like, have liked to have this, uh, traditionally we've had uh, these events in person, but unfortunately, as you, you guys are probably bummed out by, by the pandemic, uh, hopefully we can, as the year progresses, we can transition into having this in person as well. But for this quarterly uh, event, I am so excited to introduce uh, Manya, maybe buddy. Uh, I'll let Manya introduce herself, but she's going to be talking today about printing tech, print, printing architecture and, you know, just de demystifying um, what 3D printing is as it relates to our industry. So take it away, Manya. Thank you. Thank you, Azabaik. Uh, well, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, I'm thrilled to join this community today. And thank you for every one of you to join uh, this late uh, of the evening at Detroit. Um, I'm an assistant professor of architecture at GCME. Yes. Right, okay. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of architecture at Topman College and the chair of digital architecture research and technologies uh, known as DART at the University of Michigan. So um, I'm gonna start, uh, I, I moved from ETH Switzerland to, uh, to North America about two years ago. Um, and I'm gonna show you a bunch of project in relation to 3D print, printing and robotic in construction um, today, which uh, some comes from the work I've done before uh, in Switzerland and uh, a lot come also from the work uh, I've done in the last two years with my team here at uh, University of Michigan. So I'm just gonna start sharing my screen here um, and Please do interrupt me if I go long. Um, see, do you have my screen? Do you have my screen? Yes. Um, 
Yes. Yes, we yes. did. We see it now. All right. Okay. So, uh, printing architecture. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, start with uh, let let me give you a structure of my talk today. I'll start with the background and motivation of uh, my research uh, and the team research, and then uh, we'll start with uh, with presenting 3D printing and additive manufacturing and the way we've used it and then computation and its coupling with 3D printing and its benefit. Then I'm gonna walk you through a range of projects. Uh, and from there, uh, I'll conclude. So uh, this is uh, our team. We are a very uh, small but growing team at the University of Michigan. Uh, and uh, we encourage diversity and inclusion. Uh, we like to have researchers from different backgrounds in our team who could contribute to the field of computation and robotic with the core of 3D printing in architecture. In the next 30 years, our population is going to double. And this is uh, of no surprise to any of us. Uh, this would demand, uh, uh, will bring a demand on doubling the construction in housing and infrastructure. Uh, for that, the construction industry has to basically respond to a demand uh, of rapid urbanization uh, with a fast production of infrastructure and housing. Uh, but we all know that construction is facing challenges already. The main challenge we are facing is uh, the, uh, the shrinkage in our material resources. We are uh, already uh, like construction itself per se alone is uh, using about 30% of, of material in the world. And out of this amount, we, uh, um, we are the concrete, which is, our, which is the main material for urbanization, uh, is our second material or the second most used material uh, by human. Uh, we are already running out of sand, which is the main ingredient of, um, of uh, concrete. Uh, we are running out of uh, skill workers and trades in construction. Uh, in the next uh, 20 years in the United States, there was, uh, there was an announcement that there will be a need for 2.5 million more uh, construction workers. And there is not enough construction worker right now even to fulfill the job and the demand for affordable housing and improving the housing that is there. Um, more than that, uh, building materials and construction alone contribute to about 11% of the CO2 emission in the world. And together with building operation, which also includes the, uh, the uh, long span use of a building, uh, it contributes to one third of a CO2 emission. Uh, that number positions the importance of building and construction in a, in a different setup compared to what we used to see before. Uh, and it also questions, does construction or can construction respond to the rapid urbanization that is needed sustainably? The question, the, the answer is not, not the way we are doing it now. The way we build has to significantly change. What you see on the left side is the way we used to build 70 years ago. And what you see on the right side is the way we are building today. There isn't much changed. Uh, we have uh, laborers or construction workers running on the site. It's messy, it's unprecise. We have um, enormous amount of material waste from formwork to actual concrete. Is it really the need for so much concrete in construction? Uh, or not. Um, and the speed of production obviously is uh, slow compared to other industry when we are looking at a uh, car industry or we are looking at a uh, product industry where everything uh, is robotized. So there is, a there is a need to change the way we build. At DART, we operate at the intersection of computational design, robotic construction, 
with the core of additive manufacturing and there perhaps I should say digital fabrication because that encompasses also robotic and material processes. We believe at this uh, intersection, there is a new opportunity for a sustainable future and sustainable built environment. So what we do in our team, we develop technologies by which I mean design technologies. We develop also fabrication technologies. We develop processes in relation to, let's say, existing digital technologies that we want to implement into a process where the approaches are not yet there uh, or uh, new approaches for new technologies. But more than processes and technologies, we also look at our buildings and building elements. We look into how does this new technologies enable us to change these building elements to perform better, to, uh, to use less energy. So it's an it's a interrelated uh, uh, area of research that we are operating at. Our motivation is to reduce the CO2 footprint from construction and demolishing the entire construction cycle uh, from transportation to construction to demolishing, reducing the um, carbon emission caused by building energy use through the, its, uh, its uh, lifespan, <coughs> excuse me, also reducing the waste in construction, as well as minimizing material consumption uh, in the elements uh, themselves. Uh, we also uh, want to increase construction speed and precision in the construction, uh, increase building performance to minimize energy use and uh, durability. So 3D printing. Um, I've been asked to get some what, uh, um, uh, fundamental with some of the some of the uh, uh, things I'm presenting. So if you are bored, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, additive manufacturing or 3D printing is a, is a technique which allows you to uh, build 3D object from raw material layer by layer usually. Uh, here you, uh, you synthesize the raw material through information and produce 3D object. And this means that, that we have to automatically change the way we design. And by the change, the change in the design, I don't mean only also the drafting, uh, but also even our CAD system. Uh, when we are in a situation where our 3D model is, uh, is our, our fabrication process is a direct 3D model from raw material, and we can produce 3D model to produce this, uh, 3D model, we have a different uh, processes than the previous processes we had in hand. Uh, we may no longer rely on 2D drawings in order to communicate our, um, our fabrication details or uh, in order to communicate our construction details. What you see here is a, on the right side down is a 3D printed, uh, it's a 3D printed uh, machine. In the middle, there is a 3D printed model. And as it was printing, uh, the information on the left is the data that is transferred from 3D model to the machine. All you need is basically your 3D model. And then you send that data directly to the machine, it's printed. There is absolutely no uh, need for a 2D drawing in order to build something. And th this is a huge change in the way we, we design and build. Um, it will also give us an opportunity to rethink our elements. As uh, we all know, architecture is an assembly of uh, building parts. It's been always an assembly of building parts. Uh, however, as technologies change uh, and the new technologies uh, or economical social challenges are introduced, our building elements are changed and reinvented, just like the industrial revolution. 
But then these very uh, planner building elements may no longer be relevant in the next 30, 40 years because with, with 3D printing, we are actually uh, able to print the entire element uh, and be in control in a different level, by which I'm trying to say, we can be in control of our building element surface. We can be in control of their thickness. Uh, we can control the inner uh, structure. We can introduce void. We can um, maybe activate these voids for particular function, thermal function, or integrate building services. We can already print the details for, uh, for connections as part of our building elements. This is a very different, I would say, animal or a technology we are dealing with. It's very different from any other technology that we've worked with before, where you cut or CNC laser, CNC mill, or CNC bend. Uh, it, it makes you think differently also. It gives you too much opportunities, uh, which one wouldn't have before. So what you see here is uh, one of the largest uh, 3D printing technologies out there. Uh, it's a binder jetting technology where uh, sand is uh, binded layer by layer in order to build a 3D model, a 3D uh, part. Uh, with this uh, machine, you can print parts in res resolutions of sand. So the pixel you can achieve here is 40,000 pixel in the length and 16,000 pixel in the width. Um, this is higher resolution than your most TVs we have at home right now. Uh, and uh, that means <laughs> we can achieve um, a highly detailed 3D part. Uh, and we can print them in 24 hours no matter how complex they are. Uh, it, this technology doesn't care if, you're, if your part is a box or your part is having a highly detailed ornation or inner, uh, inner structure. It, it has to print from one side to another and keep going upward no matter what. So let's play and see uh, how this uh, is working. As you see, it, it prints and the, the loose sand is where it's not binded and where the geometries are, what the geometries are given to the, to the machine, let's say if it was a box or if it was a sphere, that those parts which was a geometry in, in, inputted to the, to the machine is a binded and it turned to darker green. That's where the binder is added to the sand every layer and binds the new layer with the previous layer. So we use this technology to 3D print joints, aluminum joints, with the students at ETH. And the idea was to explore uh, how precise we can go with this technology. Uh, is it really through that we can do mass customization? Uh, and how complex uh, uh, this system would be for us to implement in architecture? Not forgetting that 3D printing, uh, uh, the binder jet technology has been initially developed for, uh, for use in casting industry. They have been using it for a while to cast uh, car engines. It was just that uh, not any architect really was, uh, was exploring this technology. And perhaps the one that I know has been exploring it for furniture. So uh, we use this technology and uh, in combination with computation, which would allow us to uh, generate 180 joints, about 180, it's 182 actually, joints. Uh, we could generate mold for each single joint that were different in their geometry and shape uh, in less than a day. Uh, we didn't have to design every mold. Uh, the molds were automatically generated because we developed rather a procedure, a computational procedure that would automatically take the joints as an input and generate the molds as an output outcome. All the three parts, the inner core and the outer core, which was needed for casting those joints. So once uh, sent uh, for printing, these joints were packed together and uh, were then cast. 
And uh, this was a video, but it was so heavy to play. So we decided just before uh, this event uh, started that we'll just show you a picture of it. So what you see here is an aluminum, uh, molten aluminum uh, pouring, being poured into uh, this, uh, this giant, gigantic mold. Uh, I can tell you it's about 40 to 45 joints that are being cast at once. So these molds were connected to each other through a mega uh, a channel. And those channels were connected to a core channel where aluminum work was casted in and distributed to this 40 to 45 joints that is inside this box, leading us to produce a space frame structure uh, that is uh, as big as a Bangalore. It's 16 and a half foot high and it covers 1,000 square foot. And it's built of 182 uh, non-standard aluminum joints, by which I mean every joint is different. There is no two joints that is in any way similar to the other one. Um, so what's interesting here is that every joint is architecture of its own. Every joint is kind of optimized. And it didn't take more than four days to assemble this entire, uh, this entire, um, sorry, it didn't take more than four days to uh, produce all the joints, the 180 joints, which if you would have done with a traditional way of constructing mold, it would have taken you uh, way more than four days. And it did take less than uh, three to four days to assemble the entire pavilion from custom joint and off-shelf rods. Um, this, this combination of computation and uh, 3D printing has kind of proven to be sustainable for mass customization. Um, I'm having questions in chat. Uh, are you guys, or there's two or not maybe. Um, okay. So what that take us to is um, the next uh, topic uh, that I would like to cover, uh, which is resource saving structure. Uh, and in this section, I would like to show you how computation and then with 3D printing in particular, would allow us to uh, produce structures that are uh, using least material, least material possible actually. Um, so what you see here is a cross, a cross section of human femur. On the left side, you see the stress line of this uh, bone structure uh, drawn as a diagram. On the right side, you see the actual cross section where the tissues, bone tissues are distributed. Um, even in nature, material is not everywhere. It is distributed only where it's needed. Uh, it is placed along the stress line by which where the forces travel, uh, and uh, and uh, material are needed to carry that load through the entire geometry. So this is something that interests us. We ask, can we uh, design with minimal material using similar technique? And what we look at is concrete slab. And why concrete slab? Um, as, as a case study, because uh, concrete slab, it's actually an interesting topic of research in general, because for one thing, it takes 85% of buildings total self weight, and it's unnecessarily massive. Um, concrete slab doesn't have to be uh, solid and massive. The reason they are massive and plant in some sort of box like shape is because concrete is cheaper than building formwork uh, in general. So if you were going to build a, a standard formwork, it would have taken 44% of your construction costs. And uh, if you would have gone to a non-standard uh, formwork system, uh, which is for a uh, non-box slab, it would have been even more than 44%, that's around 70 
percent of formwork. So um, we are not unfamiliar with rip like a structure. It's been there since 1951. Uh, this is a, a project from Nervi, which is a rip structure for a factory, uh, the wool factory in Rome. Uh, and uh, within this project at the time, uh, they've used also a similar technique to place material only where the stresses would be traveling, but doing it really with hand rather in terms of drawing and placing this stress line rather than, um, rather than placing them uh, through computation. So uh, this is uh, the drawing of this project. On the left side, you would see where the uh, where the ribs, actual ribs are, which would carry the main load. And on the right side, you would see the fabrication technique used in here. So at DART, uh, we uh, then generated, uh, developed like kind of a procedure where a designer could start moving their support system. And, and this is already part of, let's say, Grasshopper, but the entire procedure from running from a uh, stress line all the way to generating the slab is a procedure that we developed to easily move these uh, support system and automatically receive your slab and even decide parametrically what you want to add uh, as, as part of this. Um, so those stress lines are automatically translated into mesh and ribs. You can decide on the width of each of these ribs and uh, you can even decide what is your secondary rib if you wish. And then uh, once you like it, you generate the, uh, the, the overall surface. Uh, and this is a section through uh, of this example that I just showed you uh, where you can, um, by just moving the position of your support system, you can generate your main ribs. You can also define how, uh, how high or how short each uh, rib should be or how wide and how narrow should be. You can create you can define this as number and the system would generate this for you. Um, or if you want the surface of the slab to be at the bottom, or if you prefer the surface to be at the top and see the ribs, for example. Other ways of uh, generating the, uh, uh, or exploring uh, building elements, and in this case, a slab through, uh, for, for, um, material saving uh, and minimal material is topology optimization. And with topology optimization, you can achieve a three-dimensional uh, optimal form uh, and uh, place uh, basically uh, generate geometry where it, it, uh, it suggests where material should be based on the supports and the forces that are defined. In this case, this is a slab with four supports and the uh, uh, dead load uh, of the slab itself. And then you would probably, uh, now, now that you saw the computational technique, the two computational technique used for material reduction, you would probably say, well, building these things are probably very expensive. Uh, but that's when the 3D printing again comes into play. Yes, it would have been either impossible to build this form, uh, with the previous uh, CNC milling or uh, CNC laser cutting techniques that we had, or it would take forever to make the panels, or uh, it would have been super expensive. But if you can really print the formwork in sand, this is the sand printed formwork, but it's sprayed later as white, and then cast concrete inside it, we casted concrete inside it. If you just pull sand, it will break. So uh, this, this slab is a combination of sandstone and the concrete uh, that was cast in it. And the concrete is a mixed ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete, uh, which allows, uh, allows for, the, uh, for the slab to take care of the tensile uh, forces. 
Um, and here uh, we used only 50 liter of concrete versus 250, 270. That would be a typical amount of concrete you would need for the same bounding of a slab in this size. Uh, we basically reduced the material consumption to 80%. Uh, this is 80% lighter, uh, less material than uh, we would have used if we would have cast the entire thing as, uh, as, uh, as a box. Uh, or a bounding box. So now that I've shown uh, how computation can help generating uh, optimal form, and then I've shown how 3D printing can allow for a customized design, but also provide for lightweight uh, production of lightweight building elements, I want to add something before I go to my next project where I was asked to be more detailed or show more uh, detailed by Azobac initially. Um, architecture is not uh only about optimization and we all know that so it would work for this slab to be only optimized uh but it, it's not always working for every project to be uh, purely optimized because we have uh, multiple criteria in design we may have to move us a uh, move uh, uh, uh move something somewhere just because we need that space or we might have to integrate something else because we need to accommodate for HVAC system. And that means that we need to develop also our own design interface and design tools that would allow to explore for minimal material, but at the same time, meaning going toward optimization, but at the si same time allows us to explore because optimization goes toward a point and there is one solution. Uh, and, and in design, we want a solution space. We want to have alternative solutions and we want to be able to alter our parameters to, uh, to find the solution that suits best into, <laughs> into, our, into our problem. And I think Smart Slab is, the, is a very good project in showcasing that. Um, I've been the project lead of this project uh, in Switzerland, but this project by every mean is a very highly collaborative project. Uh, we had a team that worked on the smart lab. We have had multiple investigators uh, that were uh, uh, working in different level of the project because the smart lab itself is part of a, a house and that house is DFAP house. So you see where the red arrow is, that's a smart slab. And uh, this whole house as a new project was a, was a shared project between multiple chairs at ETH. <coughs> and our role uh, or our responsibility was to take care of the smart slab, which was sandwiched between um, two floor timber structure on top and uh, S-shaped wall uh, right at the bottom. Uh, if I cannot move my mouse, but if you, I, I think you could see right below the, uh, the arrow, there's an S-shaped wall and above where there's a timber structure. And what's interesting uh, is that we had many industrial partners uh, to, uh, uh, to realize this project for one, uh, for one thing, it was a real world project and needed many people to contribute, but also it was not done before. And a lot of partners, industrial partners were interested and so curious to find out new approaches to these technologies. And that showcases the relevance of this technology uh, for, a, for, for the actual construction. You wouldn't have this many partners if it, if it was irrelevant to to future of construction. Um, the, the DFAP house uh, was uh, plugged in or supposed to be plugged in to this, uh, this backbone structure that you see here. And this is also another level of uh, uh, complexity uh, in, in the project. This uh, backbone structure is a research structure which uh, allows different researchers and research program to explore their project in real world. So we built our DFAB house as part of this back, or it was plugged into this, uh, which I will show in, a, in some future rendering. Um, 
And uh, it's going to be there for the next five, six years, and it's going to be in use. People actually live in it and stay in it. Uh, it's, a, it's a very, to me, interesting project. And uh, sometimes I think Detroit would probably be the best place to, to conduct such a research project. We've got so much land and we've got so much uh, existing structures that are not in use. And why can't we just turn them to uh, research um, uh, hubs uh, in this case? So um, in the smart lab, um, beyond material reduction, we also want to, or we wanted to point out at integration of building services. This makes it uh, very interesting in a way that it redefined new territories for architects and the role of architects uh, in the next 30, 40 years. Um, this is an exhibition from Rem Kulhas in Biennale, where he stated uh, that uh, the, the slab or the ceiling became the space of uh, mechanical uh, devices where architects has uh, no interest and has lost the territory. They have no interest to intervene and more and more we are losing the control over this area of architecture. And that's why I, I think it's interesting to um, actually think about a slab because the slab is usually accommodated with a bunch of mechanical uh, uh, devices which for which we lose a lot of height. Uh, it is totally not um, in design space. It's gone uh, from the design space. And perhaps with, the, with this project, uh, we could have explored new uh, opportunities to operate in this space as architects and as designers. So this was an early diagram of smart labs, which we wanted to express the idea of what it should be. Um, we wanted a slab that really has minimal material, uh, so it's not everywhere. And then all the, uh, all the uh, uh, air dock uh, and uh, the um, lighting and the, the HVAC and the, um, pipes are integrated into the slab itself and are not like an add-on to the slab. So this was, uh, this was an, uh, a motivation beside material reduction in this slab. Also another motivation was how to design it so it expresses the potential of 3D printing uh, aesthetically because also at the end we are an architect and we would like to produce stuff that are, that are beautiful. Uh, and we should be doing that. Um, so this is the rendering, <coughs> early rendering of the project, uh, where you would see the slab from below, uh, the two floor uh, timber structure. It's, uh, it's a 72, about 72 a square foot of slab. It's cantilevering toward the glass. It carries the load from the units above and it transfers the load down to the S-shaped wall in, in the concrete shape. It also receives um, wind load from the mullions on the, on the facade, uh, as you see here. So um, it's, really, it's really mediating between multiple elements. And uh, yeah, the, the, system, the slab was uh, made uh, from, uh, well, the structural system was a rib uh, from two, in two direction, rib and shell. Uh, so the ribs were carrying the main load and the thin shell uh, were uh, taking care of the shear uh, load and uh, making the ceiling. It's kind of the other way around compared to nervous project where you could see the ribs from, uh, from the, interior here you won't even see the ribs the ribs are up and hidden uh, below the ceiling um, and it's built of uh, 11 segments that were prefabricated and the idea would be that we prefabricate these uh, segments then we move them on the side and we assemble them um, here you see the section uh, of the slab uh, where uh, it shows a 20 millimeter thick, and that's about an inch 
concrete uh, shell at the bottom, and then you have uh, these uh, ribs uh, that are uh, containing uh, rebars, or the green one is post-tensioning tubes for uh, post-tensioning, and then the red ones are a rebar and a stirrup. Uh, and then you have the blue and the yellow, which are uh, conduct and pipes that are integrated as part of the ceiling. So rather than having all those on top of the ceiling where you would just decrease the height of the unit, you would integrate it where usually you would have had concrete, unnecessarily amount of concrete. How am I doing with the time? Oh. <coughs> so. The design uh, was literally ecology of computational model. It was uh, working with multiple uh, softwares and uh, we were developing codes in between multiple softwares and our own interfaces to communicate between them. So it was never a mega structure beam model in a, in a sense that it's only one single software that makes all the solutions to this problem. Uh, before I show how the RIP were generated, I'm, I'm going to show some detail about how we conceptualize this. And as I went through the material yesterday, I found it really interesting because I've not seen this myself for a long time. Um, this is a very early sketch and we were thinking how the post-tensioning should go through the slab and uh, where should be the tensile cable, where are the beams? And it's so funny, as much as we've done a lot of computation, still the early sketches were with hand and you know the idea, the brainstorming, the, the walls at the back and like, how do we want this? Because the tension, tensile cable and the ribs are going to impact the, way, the look of our slab. We, we've done all of that really by hand in the beginning before, before really going computation. And at very early stage, we even have been thinking about segmentation because we knew we're not gonna build this thing all in one set. It's gonna come in segments. And even every, every segment that I showed you as a, as a as a slab segment itself is built of multiple parts. So we were thinking, do we want to see all these seams as a, as a grid on that slab? Or do we want to see it as part of the slab? And how do we actually generate this as part of a 3D uh, modeling of slab? So it was really encoded then because we were thinking about it at early stage. And this is really conceptual sketch. Um, because the slab changed significantly later. As you see, there is no secondary ribs here in the other direction. Everything goes from the center to the side, where later we had these secondary ribs going uh, against the, the, these ribs and perpendicular to them in a, in a way. So um, it, it, was, it was nice to go back and see that, well, we've actually thought of all of this at early stage. That's why we, we did integrate it into our computational system later. Um, so this would basically show you how we generated this, uh, the rib layout uh, in negotiation of the dead load from the top unit and this uh, transfer of the load to the S-shape wall right below. So it was really a, a kind of a negotiation between these elements and it's been in constant change and modification throughout the design process. But if we wouldn't have the parametric model, we could probably never um, change so easily and explore so easily between our scenarios. And um, in parallel, we had these uh, evaluation and optimization model where would very quickly give you outcome for uh, the, 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 um, str the structural performance. But this was by no mean to give us a full structural analysis, but rather give us a quick um, scenario uh, result on how bad or how well we are doing with our, with our rib layout scenario. And here uh, you see this in-house um, in house design interfaces, which I was talking about that we have to develop our own design interfaces. Not that we want to necessarily, but we have to because there isn't one out there, uh, which allows us to minimize material, but still allows us to design. And it's not per se uh, directed toward optimization. Uh, 
alone. And uh, that was an, a model we had that we could explore rib layout. We could um, calculate how much concrete the, the rib has because at all time we had to calculate our budget, communicate with other uh, partners in, the, in this uh, project to let them know what we are doing, how much are we, where, how much material do we have? Uh, are we able to even carry the load from the top floor with this amount of concrete in the ribs? And then another, um, another 3D model where we could not only explore the rib layout, but also uh, generate the segmentation and uh, finally generate the fabrication data from, and also analyze this, um, the, the, uh, the uh, surface in relation to the 3D printing uh, itself. So, uh, that's when uh, I think the ecology of computational model is more suitable here than a top-down uh, computational uh, system that decides for everything. <coughs> yeah, and I mean, believe it or not, as much as we worked in 3D, still we had to communicate with other parties and other expertise in 2D a lot of ways. And uh, here, what you see is uh, the drawing for the rebar positioning and a stirrup. And down on the left, you would see the different variation because the ribs were changing dimension at all time and no rib was like the other. So um, they had to produce a uh, right drawing for every uh, segment. We had to reintegrate this data to our 3D model also, because none, none of the rebars were manually produced. They were CNC milled. We needed those 3D model to CNC mill them. Nobody would have gone and manually produced that so many syrup with different dimensions. Um, I'm uh, seeing uh, comma, comma, comments but i can't i can't really see them um i clicked on them and now i can close them Let's no you're fine they're not they're not questions they're more comments so okay just i'm trying to going. close I, I did open the chat and um let me close it for a second sorry i kind of opened it and i can't close it now okay so you would tell me if i get questions right yes <laughs> okay and sorry, just as we're here, uh, just to notify everyone that this is two parts. We're going to have uh, a question and answer session afterwards. So keep going, Maya. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have from now? <coughs> I mean, you have, we have another hour, like seven to eight. We, we end this at eight. So it's up to you. Right. I hope yeah. not everybody are getting bored there on Zoom. Right. It's very difficult. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, going forward, um, we still had this 2D communication going on, which um, probably in the next years might be obsolete in terms of information modeling, uh, but might be not for a creative aspect or the, the intuitive way of exploring, uh, which could also happen in 3D model. Uh, but this was existing right there, but the funny thing was that we had to re remodel all of that right back into our model. So this is uh, this is one segment uh, where it uh, was prefabricated. It was actually our test segment, and uh, we didn't have so much time. So we said we will do the test segment, and if it goes bad, we will do another one. Otherwise, if it's good, we put it right into the rest of the ribs, and we we put everything together. Um, which, which would be transported to the site and uh, be post-tension. And as you see here, uh, where the wall uh, would be is where the, the slab is on this highest uh, or thickest uh, or deepest, actually, sorry, deepest part. The rest of it uh, gets less because uh, there will be no support. There is really no need. Uh, and um, it moves between 300 uh, millimeter in height to 600. Uh, and uh, what you see here is the formwork assembly for each of these segments. So to produce that segment, we would have had a 3D printed uh, um, formwork system, which you see here. And then 
we would have um, uh, CNC uh, fabricated uh, or timber fabricated uh, 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 segments, which would be sitting on this 3D printed part. And they were already accommodated with the, with the rebar and uh, stereo, which themselves were previously CNC'd. And you can imagine how complicated this already is. We are dealing with 3D printed part of formwork and then the, the timber part of the formwork and then we have the rebars. And if I show you the, uh, the uh, isonometric drawing uh, from top to bottom, CNC laser cutting, you have then uh, CNC rebar bending, which then also have the post-tensioning tubes in green integrated into it. And then once, those two and the, the last one, which is 3D printed part are assembled together, you get the sprayed and casted concrete, which is right uh, in the middle. And uh, this is probably a better uh, image of the, of the formwork, a segment of the formwork, but I don't like to show it right away because it's kind of scary. Uh, it's like a puzzle. It was a puzzle to put all this for our, for our contractor, the guy who was working with us and spraying, he was the one who was putting this formwork together. And um, you can imagine if we didn't have the precision uh, in place, every segment would have had been different in size and that would create, create a problem for bringing it together. And that's when the Swiss craft uh, plays uh, an important role. Uh, it's, it's just so, so clean, everything like the guy who worked with us was doing this as if he was designing a watch, <laughs> uh, like building a watch. So we provided all this uh, CNC data, the 3D printed data and sent them to different uh, companies. And uh, here you see the uh, 3D printed uh, segments for, uh, for the 12 segments. And as you see, every segment has multiple color. Those represent printed part, because you can't, I mean, you could, but printing that entire thing, uh, if you lift it from the 3D printed bed, it would have break. So we would have to break this into smaller parts that we can pack it into the 3D printed bed, print them, assemble them as segments, and then, uh, and then uh, add the rest of the formwork to it. Um, so going from each segment, these are the parts within those segments. And we had about 180, 182 parts in play. And every part uh, had the detailing uh, that would interlock them together. But believe me, we did not produce this uh, manually. We had to do it automatically. And that's, again, where uh, computation become really important to process this information uh, so that you automatically get get the data for detailing that would assemble these parts together. Also, to uh, to emphasize that these uh, formworks are hollow, but also have inner structure uh, that would uh, create a stability. Sand is very uh, 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 fragile. It doesn't uh, do well with tensile. You don't want it to break under load or when you carry it. Uh, from printed parts, the printed company to where we are assembling them and uh, spraying or building concrete with them. Uh, so there are all these details involved into this uh, formwork production. This is the machine where uh, the formworks were produced. Uh, and this is one of the pieces, just to give you an idea of how uh, large they were. And what it means really to, once you take it out of the bed, you have to remove all the loose sand. And you wanna make sure as soon as you move it out of the bed, it doesn't break. So all of that needs to be checked. It comes with experience, but also you need to calculate and uh, make sure your ribs are dealing with that while the ribs are there to um, stabilize these segments, they should not make it heavy. This, these are already heavy parts. Uh, to be moved around. And this is uh, after they were all printed and post-processed, well, by post-processing, I mean, they, we add a kind of a binder on top of all this uh, to, uh, so that the loose sand doesn't just fall around. And then this is when they were put together as one segment. 
uh, which uh, then you see the, this uh, other construction site or another section uh, where this, this, these parts were moved to here and our contractor had to put these parts together to create the segment. And obviously um, then post-processing the surface so that when removing it uh, from concrete, there is no chipping and there is uh, the, the surface quality of concrete is in a, in a, uh, in a quality that we expect it to be. Um, this is a release agent uh, basically. And then uh, uh, glass fiber was uh, printed uh, on uh, uh, sprayed, sorry, sprayed on uh, this formwork system, and this came with a procedure. And really, uh, uh, if anyone had been on spraying uh, concrete or concrete shotting, you know that it's a very difficult job. We even uh, have a word, I think, in German, the um, shot gritting man. Uh, a, a man or a person who shot crit. Not everybody can do this, uh, just go there and shot crit. You need a certain precision uh, to do so. And this is an area of research that we are right now working at ETH, uh, sorry, at uh, DART in, in Michigan. We are robotizing the entire system here and are doing this through robots now. Um, so what what happened here, that formwork was sprayed with a uh, two millimeter of concrete with no fiber. So we don't see the fibers. And then uh, you add another a few millimeter to get the 20 millimeter of shell. Uh, and as soon as that a thin shell is sprayed, excuse me for the um, extensive noise here. Um, so uh, as soon as those 20 millimeter shell is sprayed, you have to uh, place the timber part of the formwork which already was containing the rebar and then cast where, where the ribs are. This had to happen really fast to not create a cold joint between the shell-like part and the, the part that was casted or the part that was sprayed and the part that was casted. And this is when uh, the casting of the ribs happened. It's kind of uh, messy, and you would be surprised that uh, such a beautiful element comes out of that messy environment. <laughs> so this is a final uh, segment, which was then transported to the site, and then uh, one by one, every of them came to the site. They were placed here, and uh, the assembly take, take, uh, took less than a week. And as you may see, it's this slab at most place is only 20 millimeter the one inch. And then um, it also was, uh, the precision was less than a millimeter. So we could actually assemble this with no problem in less than a week. Because if the precision wasn't high or good enough, this wall uh, that is below it would either be not, it would, it would be short for, for, the, for the place that the, 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 the ribs are sitting right there. And uh, top view uh, to basically show you the integration of our building services as was planned and intended. Uh, these holes were pre-fabricated. So all we had to do, get the trades there, every trade uh, come and in basically place their parts into, into this lab. And if you've been on construction side, you know how complicated it gets. You get the electrician and then the plumber takes another four days to come and then uh, the plumber comes and then they have to come back because they forgot to bring a drill to do something. Uh, this, really, this really made it an, into a different level where everybody could work and they didn't have to wait for each other. They just had to finish their work. It was pre-planned for them basically. And here you see, a bit more detail about the insulation uh, of the of the slab, and adding these uh, noise pad uh, so that if people walk on the top floor, the, these uh, there's uh, yeah the, the the transfer doesn't come down. Um, here you see the interior of the of the unit, uh, and uh, I guess if you are inside. Most of the people wouldn't uh, imagine this slab to be hollow. They would have thought that this slab is quite massive, and the detailing uh, that is right there, uh, the the, um, 
the degree of the detailing that we could achieve, it couldn't have been with any other technology than the technology that we've used. Uh, basically, fine air jetting uh, has one of the highest uh, or allow for production of a very high resolution parts. Uh, but then 3D printed, it, you can't really use it right now as, as the for at least 3D printing sand to produce the final building part because it's really fragile, but you can use it to produce building elements in combination with let's say concrete or aluminum or other parts which can take the tensile, uh, uh, can, can, can take care of the tensile uh, forces. Um, this is the uh, entire unit, the DFAB house uh, with the two floor timber, uh, timber project on top and the our slab right in the middle. Uh, yeah. So let me uh, summarize a smart slab before I get to two more project and I promise that would be uh, two more project I think. So um, in overall we were just 60% of concrete uh, through uh, structural optimization. And uh, we uh, achieve a high uh, surface quality resolution of about 0 0.2 millimeter. We uh, achieve a high precision uh, of uh, assembly uh, concrete elements that we had uh, were uh, having seven meter uh, uh, length there. They uh, were, when they came together, the precision was less than a millimeter. Well, three millimeters is written here, but it's actually a millimeter. Um, there was, uh, also, uh, the ability to produce this free form slab uh, from best book elements. And also, uh, we learned that integration of computation uh, allows us to kind of coordinate a puzzle of over 2000 custom elements. And that's including all the timber, uh, the, the, the uh, timber parts, the um, 3D printed parts uh, and everything, the plastic printed parts that we included into this puzzle. Um, and that when it comes to larger scale, we may not only um, focus on one fabrication method, but rather we may have to smartly combine different fabrication technique from CNC cutting to 3D printing uh, where it fits best to, to achieve our uh, Goal. Uh, we say technology is there. Um, what's what was the question? So here we had very clear questions, and then it was very easy to uh, kind of bring all these different uh, processes or technique together to, to achieve that uh, that question. Um, hey, Manya. Yes. Sorry, before you go forward, there's a question coming in here. Uh, why did you decide to use a rectilinear structural uh, cross section for the grid? Could you have generated a more efficient, uh, optimized cross section? And also, as you're thinking about, do you think you can maybe do the two projects in like ten minutes so there's more chance for questions? Right, I could. Great, uh, thank the you. First question: Did I understand right that why did we uh, why the ribs are kind of rectangular in a sense, like? planner in a sense is that the question yes why why are they rectilinear like uh structural yeah yeah, yeah a good a, a very honest answer would be um we were going to 3d print the entire framework system we got out of budget and then we have to rationalize as part of it for uh for um <laughs> for fitting the budget and then uh, that part would not definitely be the ceiling so it was uh it was the top and we had to then the, the initial ribs were really curved and uh, they weren't really uh, as uh rationalized as you see it had to happen because uh we changed to cnc as it fit better to our budget and our processes at the time uh, i don't remember what was the second question but i think you asked me to go for 10 minutes right yes okay so i'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to go real quick. Uh, the next project is uh, really using a, the similar uh, technology, but producing freeform lightweight GFRC facade. Uh, and uh, here we try to use uh, 
geometry as a way of strengthening material rather than uh, using, let's say, optimization method that I showed you. I'm just trying to show how with different way you can also minimize your material, material consumption. What you see is, here is Frey Otto's work on the minimal surfaces. And um, most of you, if you search for minimal surfaces such as a P surface or a PW uh, hybrid short surfaces, um, they are described as an, uh, an, an, as an expression as such. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is that with computation today, we can uh, visualize this expression. We can access this expression in a different way and uh, design them in, uh, in a different, uh, in a, in a different uh, level. And then uh, we use the 3D, I'm sorry, this is my dog. Um, uh, so we use the 3D printing to, uh, 3D printing uh, sand to produce the uh, sand formwork, which is uh, double-sided and reusable. And then I'm gonna skip that uh, where we were then able to produce a lightweight GFRC uh, uh, freeform facade uh, from, from producing the reusable uh, binary jet, uh, sorry, sand, form, sand form work. Um, this is uh, this is another picture. It's 18 millimeter GFRC, and this was also a collaboration with the industrial partner uh, between uh, Dart at Topman and ETH and uh, uh, Stoughton, uh, which was our industrial partner. So um, I'm gonna wrap up with my last project. So I think 10 minutes would be sufficient. Um, I've shown multiple 3D printing project and now I'm gonna go forward to show you how uh, with robotic, we can also shift or not shift, go to the next level uh, of how we work with 3D printing in future. Uh, and um, this is our laboratory in, uh, in, in Topman at Michigan. Um, it's actually bigger than this, but uh, we have uh, more than uh, six robots, industrial robots, uh, which are uh, on two of them on rail and a few of them not on rail. We accommodate these with, <clears throat> let's see if it plays. Uh, so the other project uh, that we are doing beyond uh, concrete is pr printing plastic. <clears throat> And here we basically accommodate the robotic arm with the uh, with the extruder in house built extruder, where we can fabricate and 3D print plastic in larger scale or polymer based material in larger scale. And um, as as you see, uh, this can be used in many uh, or have implication in many. Uh, areas. The interesting thing about plastic is that it's super lightweight, it's recyclable, uh, and with the technologies and the development we have today uh, and the bioplastic that is being researched, uh, there's a new uh, promise for plastic in architecture and construction. We've definitely explored it as a printing formwork for concrete, but more than that, we explore it as production of actual part at the end, the actual building elements. And uh, with with the, oh, sorry, and let's see if that plays. Uh, yeah, so I think it does not play. Okay, so uh, this was a video that would show how, um, yeah, how uh, direct printing uh, would allow us to explore a more complex form uh, with, uh, with uh, no support necessarily in this case. And we have achieved quite a high resolution uh, of detailing uh, as well. Um, See, um, so there are multiple uh, area of research being explored right now to print not exactly horizontal, how can we precisely start orienting or if uh, we want to print non-planner, how do we do it? We also are um, exploring how uh, we can print with multi uh, polymer material uh, 
in this case, we are printing plastic and adding carbon fiber to uh, strengthen uh, the plastic uh, where the structural load is. And, um, and uh, these are the different areas that being explored right now. Um, I have only four slides. So with, with that area of research, we've done a project together with my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Ves uh, which was exhibited at Cooper Union. Um, here, uh, I'm gonna go back to my earlier uh, diagram. Um, we intended to uh, produce a building envelope that has an interior, but it's lightweight and it's made of plastic. It's, it's an envelope, building envelope that takes care of thermal performances. And um, the design uh, was, uh, was using a minimal surfaces. I'm not sure why this is stopping. Okay. Um, this is the procedure of how we designed that building envelope and uh, that it has multiple layers. Uh, the, the darker gray one would uh, be connected to each other. And then uh, we, this was basically, the project was showcasing the future of building envelope using polymer, uh, which benefits uh, us from being lightweight. Uh, then when the lifespan of the facade is over, we can recycle and reprint and reuse the material also that we can think about the next generation building envelope because uh, the other project, the concrete project I show you was the facade concrete project was a panel, a facade panel, whereas here is an actual envelope uh, with the interior insulation uh, uh, areas or zones uh, and the detail surface detailing that would uh, come to play, uh, which you could basically activate for if you want acoustic or reflection of the light and so uh, so yeah so this project I think uh, let me see if we can get to the printing yeah it uh, was then printed um, and here you probably would see better uh, the detail or the resolution of our printing technology um, and plastic is a cheap material and uh, it's unfortunately was seen for a long time as a throwaway material and unenvironmental or not, not environmental friendly material, but this is to be changed. It's the way we are looking at plastic has changed and it's going to ch change in the next uh, few years. Um, so I'm just spitting this here. And I'm gonna go to, I'm, I'm gonna finish my talk with a video um, from 1957 about plastic. It's a house of the future. Located in the park's Tomorrowland section, the walkthrough was meant to give its visitors a first-hand look at the future of home design. Not only with its innovative and stylized exterior, constructed out of the relatively new material plastic, but also with the cutting edge appliances and technologies it featured inside the house as well. But before we get into all that, so um, yeah, so that was that's my last video, and I will conclude with this slide um, uh, first on the plastic that uh, it basically um, it basically was there already at a time. It just didn't work out because uh, we it was not suitable for the time. We couldn't recycle, and there was no bioplastic. <laughs> but then there was already a 3D printed house, and this is what we are. We are working on now for the next uh, year to focus on tiny plastic house and um, 3D print with it and not just plastic but other material but that's an, a, a very interesting area we are excited about. Um, to conclude, um, I've shown you guys uh, multiple projects uh, with uh, different material. I've shown how a uh, combination of 3D printing and computation uh, would allow us to uh, address the challenges we have uh, today in the world, but also uh, uh, provide us with opportunity uh, as designer, as architects, uh, and opportunity to uh, have a different level of control. And uh, we are in a very um, exciting time because uh, 
everything is changing. Uh, there are challenges, but at the same time, there are also a lot of technologies around and they are not yet fixed in place. Um, so the way we choose to work with this technology will also direct the future of our field and would direct the, the, our role and territory in this larger ecosystem of uh, uh, architecture, engineering and construction. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>